Hello, this is Professor Ryan Paul, and this is my second lecture on Othello, Race, and Shakespeare. Let's begin by talking briefly about the significance of blackness. What ideas was it associated with in the Renaissance and Middle Ages? Well, as it is still today, blackness was often associated with evil, with danger, with death, with mystery, those sorts of connotations, uh, which it still has in Western culture today uh, very often. Blackness also was specifically associated with demonic beings, with the devil and demons. They were very often represented as having black skin um, in paintings and uh, plays. Any sort of art, uh, any descriptions of the devils, uh, devils and demons would refer to them as having black skin, as we can see in this image on the right side of the screen. And in case you're wondering, yes, that devil does have two mouths that he is eating people with. Blackness also has special connotations in the Renaissance when it comes to the subject of female beauty. Um, there's the opposition between fair and black, and this means light hair versus dark hair, lighter skin versus darker skin tones, like people who maybe be tan, have a tan, or olive skin tones. Not black in the way that, in the racial sense, but people who are slightly darker. So there's a preference, conventional preference, for people who have lighter skin color, lighter hair color. Um, lighter skin color is associated with nobility, people who have darker skin, or people who work out in the sun, and so forth. So when Lysander, in Midsummer Night's Dream, after he's become uh, enchanted and he's trying to explain why he has changed from loving Hermia to Helena, he says, Not Hermia, but Helena I love. Who will not change a raven for a dove? A raven, of course, has dark feathers, a dove has white feathers, so the suggestion is that uh, Hermia has dark hair, Helena has blonde hair. Uh, not always cast that way, but that's the suggestion in the line. So fair versus black, there is that conventional association of fairness, light, lighter skin color, and lighter hair color with more beauty. But at the same time, there is a trend for poets to praise blackness as beautiful. Um, and the idea was this showed just how skillful the poet was because they could take uh, the natural expected connotations of blackness and twist them around with their language and skill and make it beautiful. So it was sort of a way of poets showing off. And the prime example for that would be the Dark Lady of Shakespeare's sonnets. The Dark Lady in sonnets 127 to 154 that he praises, who is both um, apparently physically dark, either in her hair or skin tone, and also, as we'll see on the next slide, morally and sexually dark. As Shakespeare's Dark Lady shows us, blackness is not only connected to external beauty, but blackness is also connected to the idea of female virtue. Blackness as a sign, perhaps, of evil or danger. So the two opposed terms here are fair and foul. Foul being, um, since it has the meaning also of something that's dirty or soiled, foul suggests blackness in this economy of beauty, of one versus the other. So we have the fair on one side and the foul on the other, both terms that Iago will use repeatedly in one of his scenes in Othello. But something just to point out, in all these definitions from fair of fair, and these are all from the OED, we can see that while fair normally means beauty and goodness, etc., etc., virtue, it also means speech that appears pleasant, but that's intended to deceive. So even the fair woman, even fair speech, can be deceptive. And foulness, in addition to meaning all of these things about a being offensive or disgusting, diseased, dirty, wicked, etc., etc. It can also mean, specifically when used of a woman, a woman who is sexually immoral, a woman who is loose, promiscuous. So fairness and foulness, fairness and blackness are related both to female beauty and to female virtue. And that connection shows the duplicity of appearance once more, that while a foul woman might be easily identified, a fair woman might also be deceptive in her fairness. Now, while blackness had these metaphorical connotations, there was also an awareness of people who had skin that was markedly different in color, what we call black today and what was called black 
in those times as well. And so there's this awareness that there are people who look different and who look radically different, not just in the way, say, an Englishman and an Italian might look different uh, in their skin tone, but that have very different physical appearances. And a lot of this was because of increased trade and travel. So there was this awareness, uh, more contact and more immediate contact between the peoples. And so black became the label for difference. It became the easy way to identify people whose physical appearances seemed radically different. And the problem here is, of course, that the cultural values of blackness become sort of confused and they become combined with attitudes towards foreigners, which, of course, are always going to be um, ambiguous and ambivalent. Foreigners can be both feared and respected, welcomed and, uh, and hated, etc. So this overlap and association where the ideas, the spiritual, metaphorical ideas of blackness became conflated, combined, confused with attitudes towards people whose cultures were different, people who had different practices, who look different. So the sense of black skin being then tied to and associated with these uh, negative connotations of evil, danger, the devil, etc., etc. An important question to clarify here is just who was called black? What sort of skin, what appearance qualified as black in the Renaissance? Well, our modern definition of black is people who can trace their descent to sub-Saharan Africa. And there are certain physical features that we attribute to this group of people, although, again, there's a vast diversity uh, within that. But that's the basic modern definition of blackness. Um, in the Renaissance, however, people who were black uh, included both peoples who come from sub-Saharan Africa and peoples of northern Africa and the Middle East, people that we would call Turkish, uh, Arabs, Middle Eastern, so people who we would not identify in modern society as quote-unquote black, but they were all counted as black from the European perspective. The other term that intersects with the term black in this period is the term Moor, which is the name given to the Islamic uh, Ottoman conquerors of Spain in the Middle Ages. So Moors uh, there's also the term blackamoors, that's a term that's used in England, tawny moors, which means uh, people of a lighter skin, so tawny moors refers probably to people that we might consider to be Arabic in modern society. But all of these terms were sort of used interchangeably to refer to people who uh, were considered, again, quote-unquote, black. And on this slide, we see an image of the Moorish ambassador to Queen Elizabeth, who, to modernize, looks far more Arabic or Persian, has obviously Islamic uh, clothes, but would have been also considered, would, would possibly have been considered or grouped together with uh, other people that have much darker skin, people from sub-Saharan Africa, that we would call, again, black. This is a famous illustration by a man named Henry Peacham, made in approximately 1595, and the supposition is that this is a scene from Titus Andronicus, uh, the first of Shakespeare's plays to, figure, to feature a black character, who we see on the right, um, and the idea is that is possibly Aaron the Moor, uh, who is pictured as having dark black skin in this image, Possibly the actor would have um, used some sort of makeup, probably, to darken his skin. But he also has um, European-style clothes, so it's unclear as to what exactly Aaron would have been represented as, or how he would have been understood. Probably closer to the modern conception of someone who was black, um, someone from sub-Saharan Africa, as opposed to someone of Arabic descent. And here are just a couple of other images, um, not from England. On the left, we have a drawing um, that was called from an Italian sketchbook uh, of someone that's referred to as a Moor of quality. And this figure has a sort of mix of North African and Sub-Saharan African um, features and uh, clothing. On the right, we have a Spanish painting called The Three Mulattoes of Esmeraldas. These are three um, uh, black, uh, mixed black uh, and Spanish nobles who uh, lived in the New World. So we can see again there's a there's race in this period is there's a continuum and it's much more 
fuzzy than in modern definitions. What exactly counts as black and how these people are grouped together or seen as, as different. It's a, it's a much hazier category in this period than it is in modern day in certain senses. One of the questions that has uh, interested many scholars over the last few decades has been, how do we find evidence of blackness in Renaissance England? What real presence was there of people with black skin, people who would have been considered black in the period? And there are a number of challenges in doing this. One is the historical records that we have to work with. Besides them, you know, many being lost, there's no standardized documentation practices. Uh, even when it comes to names, people spell their names differently in different documents, and people will be referred to by different names in different documents. Um, and there's no marker, there's no space to check off race in any documentation of the period. So we rely on historical records that can be spotty and confusing. And of course, they use different terminology. They would maybe call someone a blackamoor or a moor, or maybe not. They might not reference the person's race uh, or skin color at all. And again, people could be referred to by different terms at different times or places and different names. And finally, there's the sort of cultural invisibility of people who were black in this period. That is, the people of the time were generally not concerned with recording the presence of black others. Unless there was something notable about that individual, they didn't really care to mark that down that this person was black, if that person was deemed worthy of being recorded at all. So it's very difficult to find presence, the, the real presence of black people in Renaissance England. That said, Scholars have done a good deal to uncover evidence of black people living in Renaissance England. The number that I've heard is that during Shakespeare's life, documentary evidence suggests uh, that as we have evidence pointing to the existence of or, or identifying about a hundred different people as possibly black who are living in London. Now that doesn't sound like a lot. A hundred people is not a lot. But let's consider a couple things. One, the population size. The population of London in 1600 was 200,000 approximately, so one out of every 2,000 people was black. Again, not a lot, but more than you might expect given the assumption of the monochromatic nature of the Renaissance. And that's 0.05% of the population. And just for comparison, we can say that in the United States today, a little over 12% of the population is black, um, while in the United Kingdom, 3.5% um, of the population is black. Uh, the other thing to keep in mind is that these are only the people that, for whatever reason, made enough of an impression on someone that they were recorded as uh, there's some evidence recorded of them possibly being black. There may have been and likely were many more people who were not documented because, for whatever reason, no one paid enough attention to them. No one cared enough um, or thought it important to mark down their presence or to mark down their skin color. So who were these black people who lived in Renaissance England? Well, there were mercenaries, uh, for one. The English government did not have a standing army, so whenever they needed soldiers, they had to rely on pressing volunteers into service and hiring mercenaries. And the mercenaries came from all over Europe, Africa, etc. And we know from the records that there's at least one who was probably black, because he's referred to in the records as Pedro Negro, or Peter Negro, or just Peter the Black. And we know about him, again, because he was knighted for his bravery. In a campaign of the English against the Spanish, he distinguished himself for his service, and so was commended for it, received a knighthood and a very sizable pension. Um, so again, there may have been more black mercenaries, but this is the only one that we know about because he did something notable enough to be recorded. Also, there were black servants in England, in both Scotland and England. Many nobles had black servants or slaves. Uh, calling them servants, slaves, they, they definitely were owned, 
uh, but it was a different kind of slavery than the slavery that would later exist in the United States. That's not to justify it, but just to say it was a different sort of power dynamic. But they were still owned uh, by their uh, masters. So there were many nobles in Scotland and England. Um, also many women, widows and single women, um, at pretty much every level of society except for the very lowest. But women, any woman who could afford a servant, many of them had black servants and slaves. Um, on the other hand, men who were not noble, um, only the wealthy male merchants owned black slaves or servants during this period. So it's interesting that when we go below the level of the nobility, it's more often women than men who owned black slaves. Um, and finally, various others. There were servants or slaves who had been freed and who stayed on and established their own lives. There were travelers and sailors from Africa or other lands. And there were independent families, merchants, artisans, etc., who lived in the period, who lived in the uh, uh, Renaissance London or England. And one really interesting example is a man known as John Reasonable. And John Reasonable was a black silk weaver, and he's perhaps a servant or apprentice to the French Dutch silk weaver Nicholas Reason, who came to England in about 1566 or so. Um, many of the Dutch would free their black slaves or servants, so this is considered the most likely hypothesis for how John came to England. And he's initially identified in the records, various parish records, as Reason Blackmore. And that's a very typical European convention for naming black people. The last name of whoever their owner or master is, and then a label of indicating their blackness. So when black people are named in European records, this is usually how they're named. What's interesting about him is that later, Reason becomes his surname, and he's labeled variously in different records as John Reasonable, Reasonable, um, and we could see all these different spellings. Again, people did not even spell their names consistently in this period because it just wasn't a, a convention. And so it's very striking that this became his surname because that's that's unusual. And one theory is that this indicates that uh, he was recognized for being particularly cooperative and reasonable and compliant. That they noted this is someone who is gets along with other people, etc. Um, and his family, he's become noted because he lived near the Rose, which was um, a popular theater house in London where many of Shakespeare's plays were performed, and Shakespeare's own residence from 1579 to 1596 or so. They lived very close to Shakespeare and the Rose Theater. And there are records of the Rose buying silken goods for their performances. So some people have theorized, is it possible that he could have sold silk goods to the Rose? Um, and some have gone even farther and suggested that possibly Shakespeare and other playwrights were influenced in their creation of black characters by their knowledge of this man, John Reasonable, that they knew this person, knew who he was, and he inspired them to create their characters. And one critic even argues that there is possibly a uh, sort of an in-joke, a reference to John Reasonable in Shakespeare's Merchant of Venice. Of course, we don't know, but it's fascinating to show how to see how black people were present in Renaissance England and may have been involved in the Renaissance theater and Shakespeare's theater. So in the last section, we're going to look at some of the sources of the ideas about blackness. And in order to understand how blackness was interpreted and that these interpretations differed, that is, there wasn't a single accepted understanding either of what caused blackness or difference, nor was there a single accepted understanding of what it meant, what it represented, what it signified about others, people who were identified as physically uh, other because of their blackness. So causes ranged from internal physical causes, what we might call, call biological, to external or environmental causes, to spiritual or moral causes. Uh, and really the question comes down to, 
Is the difference superficial? Is it quote unquote skin deep? Or is it essential? Does it mark them out as totally different from us? So a superficial difference is something that is only a slight separation as of us from them, or is this an essential difference of us from them? And there's a great debate about this, so we'll look at a few different sources that put forth different theories. So here's a work by an author named Johannes Boemus, who wrote uh, a learned treatise on the ancient manners, customs, and laws of the peoples in Hapriding, Africa, and Asia. Uh, wrote that in Latin in 1520, and then it was published in English, an English translation in 1555. And his work doesn't rely very much on reports from recent explorations, more on classical authorities, including Aristotle. And it's Aristotle's one seed theory of conception that he uses to explain the uh, uh, cause of black skin. So we can see here he's talking about India, and he says that they're black of hue because the father's seed is black. So it's something that is inherited. Uh, also notable is that he talks about how while they do not have any written language, they still administer by law, and he admires them because they are not deceitful, they're very honest. Uh, so that is one of our sources. Here's an ex excerpt from the work of uh, the theologian and writer Stephen Batman, great name, and his work Batman Upon Bartholome, uh, which is a commentary on a 13th century work by Bartholomaeus Anglicus. And he uses humoral theory, that is the theory that the body is made up of a balance of different fluids or humors uh, to explain the cause of the different colored skin. So if you take a moment to look at this, you can see how he describes where the the skin comes from the inward humors. And he also says that in Ethiopia, the heat has burned the blood. And so the people are, uh, that's the cause of black skin. It's an external cause. So he has a mix of external and internal features causing blackness in his theory. And uh, so notice that he talks about, again, that it's something that gets passed on from generation to generation. And interestingly, that leads him to the conclusion that if someone who is dark skinned um, moves to a country that is colder, that is not so hot, they have uh, children whose skin color is not as dark, which is questionable, scientifically speaking. Jean Baudin, a French philosopher and historian and economist, uh, it, in his work on the method for the easy comprehension of history, also draws on Aristotle's theories, uh, claiming, claiming that fire and sun color men black. And he uses these theories to justify, um, in line with Plato, justify slavery, enslavement, domination of other peoples. He says that some people are made better than others and some worse from the very difference of sight. On account of this, it is necessary to restrain these peoples by laws. So we can see how the awareness of racial difference and the attempt to understand that racial difference already includes with it the creation of racism or um, hierarchy, authority, relations of power and domination. So here's an excerpt from George Best, his true discourse of the voyages of discovery, uh, his attempts to uh, tr establish trade routes to China. What's interesting about Best is the way he combines biblical explanation with uh, sort of pseudo-scientific explanation. He talks about how he has seen an Ethiopian brought to England who fathered a child with an English woman, and uh, the child was just as dark as the father. And he says, based on that, he reasons that it seemeth this blackness proceedeth rather of some natural infection of that man, that neither the nature of the clime, the climate, neither the good complexion of the mother concurring could alter anything. So it came from the man's seed. Um, and he says it must be uh, from some natural infection of the inhabitants of that company, and they are all polluted with the same blot of infection. So notice that he has this 
scientific idea of inheritance, but he's also combining it with language of disease. He considers it a pollution. And this is because he traces it back to the story of Noah and his sons. And the story that while Noah and his sons were on the ark, Noah commanded them to be abstinent, to abstain from carnal copulation with their wives. But Ham, the wicked son, disobeyed. And so he slept with his wife in order that his child would inherit and possess all the dominion of the earth, because he would be the first child born in the new world after the flood. And so because of this, God cursed him. God would, that is, God willed, that a son should be born whose name was Chus, who not only itself, that is, not only himself, but all his posterity after him should be so black and loathsome that it might remain a spectacle of disobedience to all the world. And of this black and cursed Chus came all these black moors. So Best puts it in both a racist and religious discriminatory argument that he connects the uh, color of skin to an ancient biblical um, violation and also connects that to contemporary conflicts with Moors. A similar text comes from Richard Jobson, another traveler in uh, Africa, and he combines the religious story with fears about sexual immorality. And he draws his story from a slightly different uh, tale of Noah, where after they have landed, uh, after the flood is over, one night Noah gets drunk. And Ham goes in and sees his father drunk and naked, and then goes out and says, hey, brothers, our dad is drunk and naked. The other brothers, they go in and discreetly cover up their father without looking at his naked, shameful body. So here, that's the story that Jobson is relying on. The curse of the story, the curse that ensues, again, extends to Ham's children. And the curse comes not only in their black skin, but in laying hold upon the same place where the original cause began. And what is the cause of the curse? Well, it's Ham seeing his father's genitalia. So Jobson says that the men of Ethiopia are cursed with such members after, as are after a sort burdensome unto them. That is, genitalia that are so large that they can't even carry them around comfortably. And this causes them to be uh, dangerous to the pregnant women. So that is why the pregnant women will not sleep with them while they're pregnant, because they don't want the child to be destroyed. So the enlarged genitalia is a sign of, their, of this sexual curse, Yet it also causes them to be promiscuous because once a man uh, cannot lay with his pregnant wife, he has allowance of other women for necessity's sake. So we can see in this the religious, uh, combine, combining the religious and racial uh, difference with a sexual immorality, with a fear of sexual immorality, and with a kind of displaced vicarious pleasure at the promiscuity and sexual potency of the racial other. We can see that the association of blackness with sexual immorality was a common theme uh, in Sir Thomas Herbert, another English traveler, his work, he says that black-faced Africans are much addicted to rapine and thievery, that it's part of their nature to be such. Um, and he remarks on how they barely cover their modest parts with just a piece of raw leather. Um, and he says that they are so sexually overexcited that most have but one stone, that is, testicle, the other is forced away in their infancy that Venus, the goddess of love, allure them not more than Pallas, the goddess of war. So the idea is that by nature they are so um, consumed with sexual desire that they have to have a testicle removed in childhood so that they will not uh, be completely consumed, so they will still be able to engage in violent behavior and not just lustful behavior. Uh, yet even still, they're still over, overtly sexual. Uh, and what's also interesting, uh, from, in, to use a polite term, from uh, in Thomas Herbert's perspective, is that he uses a sort of pre-evolutionary discourse, racist discourse. Um, he compares them to monkeys, and he does this repeatedly through his work. He talks about uh, 
how he compares the the uh, various uh, racial others to animals, to various primates, uh, and that would become a common staple of 19th century racist discourse. But here we can see it anticipated in the 17th century. Now we've seen a couple positive uh, comments, um, and lest we think that there was nothing but pretty much negative assessments, there were some people who had a more welcoming or open attitude towards people who were different. Um, and there's a, some of that in this uh, excerpt from Sir Walter Raleigh's Discovery of Guiana. Raleigh was a famous uh, poet and explorer and soldier under Queen Elizabeth. And his discussion here, he's talking about his travels to South America. And he says that in the branches of the Orinoco, the Orinoco River in South America, he says never that he never saw anywhere a more goodly or better favored people or a more manly. So he's very positive about them. And he even goes so far as to say, a stranger had his wife staying at the port where we anchored. And in all my life, I've seldom seen a better favored woman. I've seen a lady in England so like to her, as but for the difference of color, I would have sworn might have been the same. So he can recognize beauty and see that that skin color is the only thing that really differentiates. Um, and so he seems, at least in some parts of this, to be very welcoming, very egalitarian, equal-minded, we might say. Um, but let's not get too congratulatory. Uh, Raleigh then goes on to say, Guiana is a country that hath yet her maidenhead, never sacked, turned, nor wrought. It hath never been entered by any army of strength. So he figures the land itself as a virgin woman uh, that has yet to be sexually violated. Um, and then he goes on to say that he hopes Queen Elizabeth will give order to sack the country, to take its maidenhead and, and take its wealth. And he says that Her Majesty hereby shall confirm and strengthen the opinions of all nations as touching her great and princely actions. And where the south border of Guiana reacheth to the dominion and empire of the Amazons, those women shall hereby hear the name of a virgin, which is not only able to defend her own territories and her neighbors, but also to invade and conquer so great empires and so far removed. So in an odd play here, uh, Raleigh asserts that Elizabeth will be promoting her own virginity and virgin power by taking the virginity of Guiana, uh, and specifically taking it away from the Amazons, a rival group of pa empowered, powerful women. Um, so this is a complicated text in that it shows both the sort of appreciation for uh, others, for racial others, while also then figuring the colonial venture as a sort of sexual violation. So the politics of colonialism bound up with sexuality and sexual desire and sexual violence. So let's just review a few ideas to close out this lecture. The idea that blackness in Renaissance England was conceptualized through multiple traditions, that issues of religion, questions of sexuality and sexual morality, questions about gender and political authority all went into theories about blackness and, of course, pseudo-scientific, quasi-scientific discourses about the body. All went into attempts to understand what blackness was. And blackness was an unstable category of identity, and just who counted as black um, is up for grabs, and we're not exactly sure who all counted as black and what was necessarily meant when someone was labeled as black. And there's a debate over the meaning of blackness, not just what causes it, but what it means. That is, in the idea that the world is the book of God, nature is, is God's book in some way. Everything is signaling to us some divine truth, and that's sort of central to the Christian worldview of the Renaissance. What does black skin mean? What is God trying to communicate, if anything, through the uh contact with, confrontation with, this particular form of difference. So uh, hopefully this has helped you to see some of the diversity and the confusion and complexity about blackness um, that is informing the culture in which Shakespeare's writing. And this can help us then to understand how Shakespeare himself is showing, in some ways, the confusing nature of identity and how 
identity, whatever its basis, um, can never be quite fixed and is always subject to debate, to discussion, and in the hands of Iago, to manipulation.